Speaking of change, let's begin by talking about language change. As Halliday points out, there is no question that language changes. Language and every particular language changes and has a history. Halliday identifies three distinct histories. Language as a system, language as evolving, the individual speaker, language as developing, the individual's development of a meaning potential, and each instance of language itself has a history, language as unfolding. Halliday's distinction between, on the one hand, language as a system, and on the other hand, each instance of language, can be compared with Saussure's long and parole. Halliday sees both long, language as system, and parole, language as instance, as two poles at either end of the cline of instantiation. And to help us understand what he means by instantiation, Halliday gives the analogy of climate and weather. Climate is a generalization made over time, while weather is what occurs at a particular point in time. Nevertheless, both clearly refer to the same phenomenon. And just as climate may be thought of as a theory, a hypothesis about the weather, so too the system of meaning potential is a theory of the text. Besides instantiation, there is also realization. What is displayed on the screen is Rukhaya Hassan's adaptation of Halliday's graphical representation of instantiation, shown as a horizontal line, and realization, shown as a vertical line. Language as system, long, is realized, realized in society, and language as instance, parole, is realized in context of situation. Hassan writes this, nothing enters the system of language, the long, except through the working of parole in meeting the realizational demands in the construal of meanings relevant to some context of situation. And what happens in parole is relevant to the evolution of the resources of the language system. The system of language evolves, and it evolves because of what happens in parole as realized in context of situation. Now, what does context of situation refer to? Malinowski used the expression context of situation. He was the first one to use that expression, but as Halliday points out, it was J.R. Firth, Malinowski's younger colleague and Halliday's mentor, who saw the possibility of integrating this notion of the situation as a kind of context into a general theory. Firth sought to relate what actually occurs in language to to a set of options specific to a given environment. A Halliday reinterpreted the Malinowski Firth concept of context of situation in terms of three concepts field, tenor, and mode. Field what is being talked about, the the ideational metafunction. Tenor who is talking to whom? The interpersonal metafunction. And how is the activity taking place? Mode, the, the textual. Hassan writes this, how the speaker perceives the situation in terms of field, tenor, and mode activates the choice of certain meanings which are realized by her choice of wordings. She continues, these meaning word choices activated by context of situation form an instance of some registral variety whose correlate is some specific category of context. One could easily get the idea that 
realization between language and society, between text and context, goes one way. But in fact, however, while context certainly affects the way we speak, it is also true that the way we speak affects how we perceive the context of situation. See, realization runs both ways. Realization represents the chicken-egg-like relationship of causality between society and language, between context of situation and text. Our speaking not only changes the way we perceive the context of situation, what we say can also change society. Hassan argues for a reciprocity between language and society. She, she writes this, our, our experience of how things work in language as it functions in real life runs counter to such linear explanations. We know, or at least we ought to know, that everywhere at every stage of human history, preachers and politicians have persuaded and are persuading their listeners purely through discourse to support some line of action which is designed to bring change in society. She continues, obviously such preaching has to precede the social action and its outcome. This makes nonsense of the linear causal explanation. To insist on such causal linearity is to underestimate the power of language in shaping human beings and their universe. The relationship between language and society is reciprocal and dynamic, each feeding back into the other. Now, usually when we think of language evolving, we think of it in terms of either phonological or lexicogrammatical features. But then, as Halliday points out, the structures, the words, the sounds are in fact the realization of meaning potential. So Halliday asks whether we should be considering the evolution of the meaning potential of languages. And since meaning potential is associated with the social functions of language, what we are seeing is the evolution of functional meaning potential. Now, when Halliday talks about functional meaning potential. We can see the, the influence of the Prague School focus on functions as uses of language. The study of language functions by Carl Bueller, a German linguist and psychologist, was, was influential in the development of functionalism in the Prague School tradition. Now, Bueller identified three functions in language. The expressive function, language oriented to the speaker, the cognitive function, language oriented to the addressee, and the representational, language oriented to everything else. Halliday, when comparing his metafunctional approach to Bueller's, writes this, my own ideational corresponds very closely to Bueller's representational, except that I want to introduce the further distinction between experiential and logical, which corresponds to a fundamental distinction within language itself. Halliday's interpersonal metafunction is a combination of Bueller's cognitive and expressive. However, Halliday uniquely added a third metafunction, the textual metafunction. The textual function is not mentioned by Malinowski or Bueller or anyone else. Halliday argues that the textual metafunction is intrinsic to language. To quote Halliday, it is the function that language has of creating text, of relating itself to the context, to the situation, and the preceding text. Consider for a moment how recent changes in the way we communicate may have affected our functional meaning potential. Let me ask you this question. Would you say that texting 
is a good thing or a bad thing? John McWhorter from Columbia University in New York disagrees with those who claim that texting will lead to the decline and fall of writing ability among young people. Instead, he describes texting as a miraculous thing, a new kind of language with a new structure. There are always people worrying about these things, and the planet somehow seems to keep spinning. And so, the way I'm thinking of texting these days is that what we're seeing is a whole new way of writing that young people are developing, which they're using alongside their ordinary writing skills. And that means that they're able to do two things. Increasing evidence is that being bilingual is cognitively beneficial. That's also true of being bidialectal. That's certainly true of being bidialectal in terms of your writing. And so texting actually is evidence of a balancing act that young people are using today, not consciously of course, but it's an expansion of their linguistic repertoire. In a paper Halliday presented at the 37th International Systema Functional Congress at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, he offers a very, a very different perspective on the impact of recent technological advances on our functional meaning potential. Halliday commented this, he said, even within one language, we can see new patterns in the integration of the metafunctions with with meanings now often packaged as a succession of bite-sized chunks to accommodate the reduced space on a small screen and the reduced time scale of much of today's interaction and perhaps the reduced attention span of the interactants. He, He continues, here both interpersonal and textual meanings take on a new prominence, though for different reasons. The textual, in integrating the various semiotic strands, with the interesting consequence that it becomes less explicit in the text, rather like the subtitles in a foreign language movie. The interpersonal, on the other hand, becoming more explicit as the exchange of meaning becomes increasingly individualized and personalized. He goes on to give this example. We are never shown parliamentary debates on our television screens, only the ranting and swapping of abuses that are thought to make good television. Halliday goes so far as to argue that by reducing discourse to a succession of bite-sized chunks, we, we run the risk of destroying knowledge. Now here, of course, you can hear the interpersonal component intruding into my own text because it is clear that I don't like to find so much of meaning reduced to a series of bite-sized chunks. And I don't like the way that any thoughtful discourse by those we have elected to govern us is overtaken by verbal brawling. And I blame the media for it. You can hear the, the, square, the scare quotes just now when I referred to good television. Now, okay, this is just one small symptom. Not in itself important, but then we are told that symptoms never are. I'm doubtful about this. But it is symptomatic of a process that I talked about somewhere else as the destruction of knowledge. Uh, A destruction of knowledge which, as an old-fashioned socialist and lifelong Marxist, I see as part of the death throes of what is now corporate capitalism. Capitalism is a socio-political structure that was spectacularly successful when it first evolved. Why? Because its controls evolved along with it. But it has now passed its use-by date and it has moved on, as most structures do. I'm saying this because it's a general property of structures, uh, that they move on from being enabling to being constraining, and in this case may destroy anything in its ruthless determination to survive. Okay, but what is happening to knowledge is perhaps not so much its destruction in absolute terms, but its polarization the increasing gap in our societies between the knows and the don't knows, replacing the old haves and the have-nots, that's become a worldwide phenomenal 
inter rather than intra-societal. Yeah. Either way, of course, it's destructive. Whether or not one accepts Halliday's argument that we are seeing the destruction of knowledge, one cannot ignore the obvious increase in polarization resulting from our unwillingness or perhaps even inability to communicate beyond bite-sized chunks. Not only is society changing, but so too is our functional meaning potential. If we rely less and less on the resources for expressing textual meaning and instead prioritize the interpersonal, what impact will this subsequently have on our potential for making textual meaning? Is our potential for making textual meaning shrinking? One cannot overstate the significance, however, of textual meaning to our very existence as human beings living in society. The textual metafunction is critically important to giving us our theories to live by. There is a tendency, I think, to treat the ideational and interpersonal as core metafunctions. And the textual is something almost like a, a third wheel, providing only peripheral support to the other two. But the textual is not just some third wheel metafunction. And textual meaning is realized by more than just thematic and information structures at the clause level. Beyond clause level, there is a patterning of choices across the text that contributes to a text's cohesiveness and coherence. Early on, a child develops the ability to create text. And Halliday describes that text as a parallel virtual universe that is made of meaning and that has its own structure as metaphor for the structures it is imposing on the material world. And what does Halliday mean when he describes a text as having its own structure as metaphor for the structures it is imposing on the material world? We tell stories. We theorize about the world, and we do so by means of the metaphor-making potential of text. Russell Mears, Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Sydney, in his book entitled Borderline Personality Disorder and the Conversational Model, a Clinician's Manual, Russell Mears likens the stories that we create to a metaphoric cinematic screen on which is portrayed a partially glimpsed personal reality. My sense of the reality around and inside me is captured metaphorically and projected verbally through my text. It is through the metaphoric text that I portray my partially glimpsed personal reality. In his paper on matter and meaning, the two realms of human experience, Halliday wrote this. He said, every theory is a metaphor for what it is theorizing. Our, our theories are told through our texts. In an address at the University of Hong Kong in 2004, Halliday refers to the relationship between grammar and discourse as an illustration of the knight's move. Like in the game of Western-style chess, the knight's move illustrates what Halliday describes as a non-linear step in the development of higher orders of discourse construction. The metafunctional organization of language actualizes this sidestep into the metaphorical making potential of discourse text. Russell Mears, in another of his books, The Poet's Voice and the Making of Mind, he writes this. The evolutionary trajectory of Homo sapiens was towards the ability to construct a story. 
the prologue to which is necessarily a proto-language that involves the use of symbols. That is metaphor. He continues, the crucial narrative which Homo sapiens evolved and that gave it an evolutional advantage was not any kind of story. It had the structure of myth. Depending upon the coordination of two forms of language and modes of thought, which have different development pathways and neurological bases. One concerns syntactical development, that is the verbal, and the other symbolic, the mythical. This myth-making potential gives us the theories by which we live. Perhaps we need to rephrase Halliday's statement about every theory being a metaphor to every theory is a myth about that which it is theorizing. But to say that something is a myth is not to say that it is necessarily untrue. J.R.R. Tolkien, he's probably most famous for such works as The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, He was part of a small group of writers who met at Oxford, and they were known as the Inklings. Tolkien acknowledged that, inevitably, the myths woven by us, though they contain error, will also reflect a splintered fragment of the true light. Text as myth. This myth-making potential. This is the non-linear step that defines our humanness, our ability to metaphorize, to articulate symbols, to theorize, to to be poetic, sets us apart from other species. To illustrate our myth-making potential, I will look at two examples, one from literature, the second from science. Both speak of change, presenting their theories, their myths. Let me begin by looking at myth-making in verbal art. Myth-making is achieved in verbal art by the way in which the writer mobilizes, by the way that he, he takes the habitual, typical pattern of grammatical choice, or what Hassan calls the verbalization, and turns it into a patterning which is unique to the text. In other words, a new automatic. The writer artistically creates a new automatic, an automatization against which to de-automatize, creates a background against which to foreground. The writer's aim is to create what Hassan calls a theme, which as she explains is a hypothesis about some aspect of the life of social man. The theme is the writer's hypothesis, the writer's theory, and this theme or theory is the artist's myth. Edwin Tumbu, emeritus professor of English literature at the National University of Singapore, has been called the father of English language poetry in Singapore. Edwin wrote the poem Language as Power for LNB for two of his closest friends, Larry Smith and Braj Khatru, the L and B. Both Larry Smith and Braj Khatru are well known for having pioneered the now well-established field of world Englishes. Braj Khatru is probably best known for his three-circle model of world Englishes. Khatru's three concentric circles illustrate the expansion of English worldwide, the The inner circle includes what are traditionally the native speaker varieties. The the outer circle includes the transplanted varieties of English in countries typically with a colonial past. The expanding circle includes regions where English is learned primarily as a foreign language. Edwin Tumbu has been writing poetry in English over both the colonial and post-colonial periods of Singapore's history. He writes out of and then against the formative influences 
with which he is familiar. Edwin, Kachu describes Edwin Tumbu as employing various stylistic devices as a, as a linguistic weapon to change the colonial language and to give it a new identity. A new identity is necessary to preserve one's own unique cultural national identity against the leveling power of a globalized language like English. Language, identity, very important. And I'm glad to see that identity is now becoming another, uh, you know, it's, it's making a comeback. And it has to because as you globalize, if you don't have a strong sense of identity, uh, you get absorbed, you get leveled. Edwin credits language with playing an important role in how he, he looks at both literature and life. He describes his poetry making technique as involving the chiseling of language, the rearranging of language, the sound, the rhythm, the tautness, the layering. Edwin's poem, Language is Power, divides into two movements, each with three stanzas. The opening line of the first movement, the beginning was the word, God, echoes the, the opening verse of John's Gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The poem begins almost hymn-like in alliterative verse, reverently celebrating the sacredness, wonder, beauty of the word as it traveled, tilted, soared into new habitations, new heritages. One can't help but feel the poet's deep sense of awe at the beauty and wonder of perfect seasons in the land, the adjectival poise of mountain, sea, and plain, songs, unfolding fragrances, lush, humming islands. Through these lines, Edwin is relating to his friends, Larry and Braj, and also to us as readers on both aesthetic and spiritual levels. Humanity joins in a, a seamless chant that binds three famous couples, which he, he names Rama Sita from Hindu culture, Adam and Eve from Judeo-Christian tradition, and Kukonyo Mumbi from African literature, whose redeeming myths still numinate, render precise the march of history. These three famous couples are cultural icons that represent unique cultural and national traditions that belong within the expanding canons of the English language. The second movement stands in sharp contrast to the inspiring picture painted by the poet in the first movement. The power and wonder of language which is so powerfully projected in the first movement is portrayed here in the second movement as diminished, corrupted. Along with the historic beginnings of speech communities, rise of empires, and subsequent expansion of English worldwide have come the, the stirrings of tribal assertiveness and linguistic chauvinism. No longer real power. Instead, the power of language has become only the play of words, or as the poet describes it, neo power. Language has been co opted into a contest for power as assertive tribes insinuate authority. In this stanza, Kotru's three circles likely inspired the textual pattern of three lexicogrammatically parallel items in a series that, that Edwin includes here. Just a, a few examples. Natal, semantic loads, empires, Katru circles. Insinuate authority, invent command, extend language into power. Tefl, tessel, TG. Ways of discourse, metafiction, streams of specialists, hypothesized, quarreled, exported heresies. Streams of specialists export deliberately misleading myths, their heresies, about world Englishes. In his paper, entitled The Past and Prejudice Toward Demythologizing the English Canon, Kotru argues against four what he calls consciously cultivated myths about world Englishes. <laughs> 
the interlocutor myth, the idea that English is learned primarily in order to interact with native speakers of English. The monocultural myth, English serves only to promote the Judeo-Christian tradition. The interlanguage myth, non-native speakers fall short of their goal of speaking English like a native. And the Cassandra myth, diversification of English is an indicator of decay and division. In contrast to these false myths with no redeeming value, Katru's myth of world Englishes is a redeeming myth whose redeeming qualities of realism and respect for non-native varieties of Englishes is captured in the final stanza of Edwin's language's power. In the final stanza of the poem, Edwin celebrates the power of language to, to adapt, daffodils mutate, and accommodate a plurality of perspectives defining room for mutual fresh realities. The word fresh is repeated twice, fresh vocabulary, fresh realities. Edwin Tumbu's language is power, reflects his own experience of coming out of a colonial past and then confronting the chauvinistic claims of those who would resist change and deny others the opportunity to make the language their own. Edwin Tumbu lived Braj Khatru's redeeming myth. But there is also myth-making in verbal science. In the language of science, Halliday observed a, a steady drift in the direction of nominalizing grammar. Things are foregrounded at the expense of qualities, processes, relations. These shifts away from the congruent through what Halliday calls grammatical metaphor reoccur with such an intensity that the shifts eventually drift in the direction of a, a new automatic in verbal science. The effect of this nominalizing grammar is that it has given scientists enormous power over their environment, so much so that they can make the world stand still or even create new virtual realities. Paradoxically, the more abstract the theorizing, the more concrete the world becomes. We see the world through the lens of the scientist's myth. The grammatical metaphor is not the only means of myth-making in verbal science. Other textual resources are also available to scientists to tell their story. And this is well illustrated in Halliday's analysis of Darwin's The Origin of Species. Halliday was fascinated by Darwin's The Origin of Species, and in particular the, the final paragraphs which conclude with what Halliday describes as its resounding climax. From so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful, most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Halliday comments this, he says, this resounding lexicogrammatical cadence brings the clause, the sentence, the paragraph, the chapter, and the book to a crashing conclusion with a momentum to which I can think of no parallel elsewhere in literature. Perhaps only Beethoven has produced comparable effects, and that in another medium altogether. Halliday writes, I do not know how long it took Darwin to compose these two paragraphs or, or whether he reflected consciously on their construction as he was doing it. I, I imagine not. I certainly had no idea when starting the analysis of what I was going to find. Halliday continues, I had the sense of a remarkable, powerful piece of writing as the climax to a remarkable and powerful book, and it struck me that something of the effect of these two paragraphs might lie in the patterning of the theme and of the new, that is, in the textual component within the grammar of the clause. This table shows how Darwin's choices of theme and new unfold throughout the final two paragraphs. They indicate the threads which cohesively bind the text together. Appearing as theme throughout the final two paragraphs are 
when Halliday identifies what he labels as authorities, the phenomena of species and so on, appearing as new information are expressions of explanation, the, the process of evolution, etc. Through his analysis, Halliday demonstrated how the last paragraph brings together all these threads into one concluding clause. There is grandeur in this view of life. It captures the expressions of ennoblement which are included in new information with its several powers from life forms and endowments occurring as theme. Having been originally breathed into from transmission and procreation as new, a few forms or into one from inhabitants and in groups appearing as theme. Whilst this planet has gone cycling on from time, past, future as new, according to the fixed law of gravity from law, natural selection, under new, from so simple a beginning, from sources, law, war of nature as theme, endless forms from variation as theme, most beautiful and most wonderful, again from ennoblement as new information. All the ideas that Darwin threaded throughout the text are reunited here, brought together here in the concluding sentence. And Halliday also observes how phonologically the, the coordination of that have been and are being forces, forces a break in the rhythm which is further reinforced by the surrounding commas. And this, this break in the rhythm directs, as Halliday puts it, maximum body weight on that final word, evolved. This, this is verbal science at its most remarkable and powerful. To quote Halliday, Darwin's The Origin of Species is a product of the impact between an intellectual giant and a moment in the space-time continuum of our culture with all the complexity of meaning that that implies. The key to innovation in verbal science, creativity in verbal art, is symbolic articulation. The, this ability to articulate symbols, metaphors, can be summed up in what Halliday calls deautomatization. And what is deautomatization? What is deautomatization? The, the term comes from Mukarovsky. It refers to the, the partial freeing of the lower level systems, the lexical grammar, the phonology, from the control of the semantics. In verbal science, deautomatization is illustrated by a grammatical metaphor. Processes, instead of being realized by verbs, are now realized grammatically by nouns. In verbal art, deautomatization is illustrated by the way the, the poet foregrounds against the background of a pattern of grammatical choice unique to the text. Now, while both Grammatical metaphor and foregrounding obviously illustrate deautomatization. We we should keep an open mind about the the full extent of our potential for turning the literal into the metaphorical. And this metaphor making potential provides the means for articulating the imagination of the poet and the scientist, turning whatever they imagine into the myths by which we live. Halliday wrote this. He said in some way scientific text, perhaps what we might call verbal science by analogy with verbal art, does, does resemble literature. There is an analogous level of interpretation, a, a double articulation within the semantics. It is, it is not that of symbolic articulation with theme, which is what Hassan called it in referring to verbal art, but that of symbolic articulation with theory. He continues, verbal art, verbal science are both dedicated to the more abstract construal of human experience, but they pursue it by different routes, different strategies of thinking out of those evolved by the human brain. 
and the two currents of thought have not infrequently merged with one another during the known history of human discourse. Toward the end of their lives, Halliday and Hassan were collaborating on a book showing how grammatical metaphor and verbal science for grounding and verbal art were really one phenomenon, which they call deautomatization, involving the realignment of the connections between the upper strata of meaning and the strata below of lexical grammar. What Halliday refers to as the night's move in language. Uh, speaking of change in language and society, whether through verbal art or verbal science, it relies on the meaning-making resources available in language. Available in language for, as to borrow the poet's words, translating psyches, achieving metaphors, defining room for mutual fresh realities.